victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me Ask our ushers to come on this last verse. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. And some sweet dead are singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. Ken Shamlin to get ready to sing for us.
I'm going to get one anyways. Just a closer walk with thee.
to be with Jesus in the robes of white Good evening. It is good to see you all again, and uh, uh, good to be here. And uh, every time I uh, uh, prepare for a sermon and uh, get ready to do uh, these things, I always get a little bit reflective of uh, the things that I've learned over the last couple of years since I've really started preaching a lot more. Um, and one of the things I've learned is that, uh, uh, you know, Pastor Will has kind of made it a tradition that whoever preaches, whether it's him, me, Johnny, Hoy, anybody, we go out to the vestibule afterwards for you all to, to greet us, shake our hands and all that. And I've learned that you never know what they're going to say to you out there. Um, it was a few weeks ago. It was actually uh, the first Wednesday of May. I was filling in on a Wednesday night for Pastor Will. It was uh, the week of the state conference, and he was already up there. So I, I preached on uh, the importance of remembering God uh, as our Heavenly Father and how that should affect our, our prayer lives um, and so afterwards, one of the ladies actually came up to me, and, and she looked at me straight in the eye, and she said, 100% better. Absolutely, 100% better. So, of course, I know what you think, because I, I was thinking the same thing. I'm thinking, man, she must have really not liked my other sermons, and she just must have really liked tonight's sermon. So I, I said, oh, uh, when, uh, do you mean like you, you, know, you like what I preached tonight? And she goes, no, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your hair. It's 100% better than last time. So I, 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 you know, and I was thinking, I, and the first thing I thought after she said that was, oh my goodness, how many other people noticed that and didn't like my hair from before? Sure enough, I had at least four other people that night tell me about my hair. I had more people talk to me, compliment me about my hair than my sermon. So I don't know what to, I don't know how to take that, but... In all seriousness, I, I, you know, one thing I always am reflective about and very grateful is the encouragement I get from you guys. Um, I remember saying this uh, a couple months ago, and I meant it, that this is a dream job for me, to be able to, uh, you know, pastor and be a part of my home church. It really is an honor, so I'm grateful to be here as always. Thank you for letting me be here tonight. Um, so let me ask you this. Do you all have days uh, that, that you have stored in your memory because there just was no other day like it? In the past, um, we probably have all heard that phrase in some way, shape, or form, where we say it was a day like no other. Whether you you heard it in a story, or maybe somebody was telling you something, or it was in a sermon, whatever. We've all heard that phrase. It was a day like no other, and we can say that that a certain day is like no other. Unfortunately, for a bad reason, maybe something tragic that's happened in your life. Uh, I can think of a few days that I can describe that way. You know, for. Uh, suffering a broken heart from a loved one passing away. And I even thought of, I think, one day that we could all relate to 
uh, no matter where you are in life, is September 11, 2001. It's probably a day that we will all say is a day like no other day. Now, I'm thankful to say that there are also good days that I describe as a day like no other. The day I graduated from Sefner Christian Academy, the day I graduated from college, uh, the day I answered the call to preach, uh, the day that I met this beautiful, gorgeous, blonde-haired woman named Tony Joe, and, of course, the day that I married Tony Joe. Uh, those are truly days like no other days. Uh, well, the Bible actually records at least one day that was like no other day in history, and tonight I'm actually going to bring your attention to it. It's a fantastic story found in the, in the Old Testament um, and when I was thinking of this, I was actually thinking of Miss Diane Hamilton. I think, I don't know if you remember, it was about a year or so ago, uh, we had a conversation. You said that you love the Old Testament because of the stories that are in it. It's stories filled with heroism, great battles, uh, uh, romance, miracles, all these things that would be just a, a great recipe for a great story. But at the end of every one of those stories, it always reveals what a great God that we serve. Uh, but the story that we see tonight, it's going to stick out because, as I mentioned, Scripture says that it was a day, there was no other day like it before and no other day like it afterwards. So if you have your Bibles, that turn with me to Joshua chapter 10, or we're going to be reading from there, Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Now in this passage, uh, what we're about to read, we're going to find that it's Joshua leading the Israelite army uh, into, a, they're, in, they're in the middle of a very heated battle with a very large Amorite army. Uh, and we're actually going to talk more detail a little bit later on about how this army formed, uh, how this battle began, and we'll do that in just a little bit. But if you found uh, Joshua chapter 10, verse 12, please stand with me uh, in the reverence of reading God's word. Uh, Joshua chapter 10. And this is what it says. Remember, this is the Israelite army, Joshua. They are in the middle of this battle right now. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Before I go any further tonight, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for just another opportunity that I've been given to, to preach your word, God. It's truly an honor to this calling you've laid on my life, God. Lord, just be with my lips and my tongue that I say exactly what you want me to say today. And God, I always say this in my prayers, but I invite you to walk up and down these aisles, that we feel your spirit, and that you use this sermon in a mighty way to touch somebody's life. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So we see here that a great miracle has occurred in the middle of this battle. But as always, the way I like to preach and study things, I want to give you more of a full picture of what's going on here in order to gain a greater appreciation of this miracle. Uh, the book of Joshua uh, really is a historical account of, well, Joshua, obviously, after the death of Moses, leading the Israelites through the land of Canaan and conquering it as, as it was their promised land give it, uh, given to them by God. Uh, even though the Israelites were uh, mostly successful, thanks to God's help, uh, they did make some mistakes along the way. We actually find one of those mistakes in Joshua chapter 9, at the preceding chapter of what we just read, uh, where we see the Israelites are approaching the city of Gibeon, which was no more than 10 miles away from Jerusalem, so not very far. They're heading towards Jerusalem. And the Bible says that the people of Gibeon had heard about this Israelite army and how the Israelites had destroyed the cities of Ai and Jericho. And basically, you know, in my own uh, Ace Andrews version of the Bible, what they said to themselves was, we have no shot here. Uh, we're not going to be able to defeat the Israelites. So here's what, here, here, let, let's come up with an idea. Let's try to trick them into forming an alliance with us. And so they do just that. They dressed up in old clothes, uh, they put on old shoes, they, they, they got these donkeys out and they put on these old sacks to, to make it look like they had come from a faraway country. They were so detail-oriented, they even got moldy bread and they carried it with them again to make it look like, hey, we really have come 
from a faraway country. So they approach Joshua, they approach the leaders, and they tell them, hey, we've come up from a far country, we've heard what you've done so far here in, in, uh, in Canaan, and we wanted to form an alliance with you. Well, that's when Joshua and the other leaders, they actually make a mistake. Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, it says that they decided to form an alliance with them, but they did it without asking God for his counsel or what he thinks. Uh, so from there, as we see, Joshua made peace with them. They formed an alliance, and unfortunately, he made a solemn, co a solemn covenant with them. Three days later, he found out that they had been duped. The people that he uh, formed an alliance with were not from a faraway land, but they were from the Gibeonites, the city they were trying to conquer. However, they were kind of between a, a rock and a hard place because, uh, because they had made a covenant before God to spare them, they couldn't break that covenant. So they tried to do the next best thing, which is they forced the Gibeonites to basically serve them. But uh, unfortunately, the Gibeonites would be a thorn in their side for, for many years to come, even long after Joshua had died. And so that I was just as, as a quick side note, and honestly, this could be a, a complete sermon in its own right. Uh, this part of, of Scripture really should serve as a reminder for everyone that before making any decision in your life, Ask for God's direction and counsel. That is an absolute must. Making a decision without God is going to put you into trouble. Again, look at this story for an example. And oftentimes when I'm studying this, I believe God often puts in my mind the high school and college age, those that are in their 20s. You often are on my heart when I think about these things because the decisions that you guys specifically make at this time, is going to affect your life for years to come. And that includes, if you make a mistake, it could have long-ranging effects. Now, that's not to scare you or to, to scare you away from making decisions, but I'm just simply trying to stress the importance of that you need to make sure that you seek God's counsel and God's will before making any decision, especially major life decisions. And now, anyway, we, we come to chapter 10. That's what happens in chapter 9. Go to chapter 10, which is where we'll be focusing on tonight. We, we see a man by the name of Adonizedek. Adonizedek, he was the Amorite king of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it actually sounds strange to think that there was a king of Jerusalem that was an Amorite, but, but remember, this is still at a time in history when Israel had not had the promised land yet. Anyway, King Adonizedek, he found out that the city of Gibeon had made peace with the Israelites, and he became afraid. Uh, see, he had already heard about Joshua and the Israelites. He knew that they were a powerful army because, again, they destroyed Jericho and Ai. And here's Gibeon, an even greater city, and they just surrendered, surrendered without even fighting. And so Adonizedek decided to call on the kings of four other cities. There was uh, King Hohem of Hebron. There was King Piram of Jarmuth, uh, King Jap uh, Japhia of Lachish, and, of course, King Debir of Eglon, and he tells all of them, hey, let's team up together and let's go against the city of Gibeon. And so they do just that. Uh, the armies of five different Amorite cities gather together and they surround Gibeon. So the Gibeonites, they soon realize we're in trouble. We're surrounded by this huge army and we're, there's no way we could defeat these guys. And so they send a message to Gilgal, which is where Joshua and the Israelites are at at the moment. If you can, you can look down in verse 6 of Joshua 10, uh, and you'll see there it says, And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp uh, to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. And I was thinking the, Gib the Gibeonites, right here, they immediately call themselves the Israelites' servants, so they must be pretty desperate to go ahead and say, Hey, we're your servants. Uh, so they reminded them that, hey, you made an alliance with us, and now it's time for you to hold up your end of the bargain. Uh, we can't do this on our own. And I was thinking, it actually reminded me, uh, when I was in high school, uh, middle school and high school at Seffner, um, I felt like I did pretty well in school, but I had to work a bit harder at math than, than other subjects. I think that's why God gave me a math teacher for a mother. It was very nice to be able to have that. Uh, so whenever I was stuck on a problem on my homework, yes, if I'm in my bedroom or whatever, I'd go, Mom, I need help with a math problem. Can you help me out? And let me tell you, for, the la for, for like seven years, I drove her crazy with question after question after question, especially when I was preparing for a test or a quiz. 
But see, the reason why I went for her to help is because I knew, well, she knew what she was doing. I could just hand her my book. I could hand her my homework and say, this is what I need help with. Can you help me out? And I actually would feel a little bit at peace. Go, okay, my mom's got this. And I was thinking it was as if the Gibeonites, they were facing a problem too, although a lot more serious than a math problem. And they decided to call on God's leader. And they thought, okay, God's people's got this. They'll help us out. And I was thinking if only the world would do that today. Uh, Warren Wiersbe points out that, you know, here we are, uh, what would be considered an enemy of the Israelites are actually an example for people to follow today. You see, the Gibeonites, when they were in trouble, they called on Joshua and God's people to help. Uh, by the way, Joshua's name means Jehovah, Jehovah is Savior. Uh, but even we as Christians need to do that. Whatever troubles, whatever difficulties we have, we need to turn to God. Uh, trying to turn anywhere else first for help is going to simply get us nowhere. Go straight to God instead. And the Gibeonites teach us that. Now, at this point of the story, I was actually beginning to wonder if Joshua would consider not helping the Gibeonites. After all, they had deceived them. They made them look stupid. Uh, but the Bible actually doesn't support that. Uh, we see in verse 7, no hesitation at all. As soon as they asked for help, we see in verse 7, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal... He and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. Now, there was no hesitation on the part of Joshua to gather his army to go and fight. Uh, but then we see something in verse 8 that probably strengthened their resolve to go ahead and, and march to battle. Uh, this is God makes a promise to Joshua. It says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not. Don't fear the, Gibe or, uh, the, the Amorites, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. So we see God promised that they would win a complete and total victory against the five Amorite armies. Now from there, we see something else. It's in verse 9. It's something that is actually pretty amazing. Now Joshua takes the Israelite army and they march all through the night from Gilgal, which is where their camp was, all the way to Gibeon, which is where the battle would be taking place. And here's why I say this is amazing. Uh, Gilgal, uh, or really the march from Gilgal to Gibeon, would have been incredibly difficult for them. Uh, Gilgal, for one, was uh, in a valley, so they would have had to march uphill, and it would have been around 3,300 feet uphill that they would have had to march over the course of 20 miles. Uh, Gibeon and Gilgal, it was 20 miles between them. And uh, Bible scholars said that it would have been at least 8 to 10 hours of hard marching nonstop to get uh, to Gibeon. And you may ask, well, wait, oh, why was there such a quick response? Why would, would they you know, respond so quickly and they were willing to, to do all this hard marching overnight? Why, why would they do this? Well, again, I think that these men led by Joshua were motivated by the promise that the Lord gave them in verse 8. This promise that, that God guaranteed them victory. And this emboldened them to head straight to the battlefield. And now, again, I was thinking another great example for us as Christians to follow today. Uh, we should live boldly because of the promises God has given you and I as Christians. Now, I was trying to do research on the number of promises found in the Bible that we can claim. And honestly, I couldn't get an exact number. It's incredible. It's, it, it's in the thousands. Uh, promises of God being there with us always and never leaving us or forsaking us. Or promises of victory. Promises of overcoming sin in our lives. Uh, promises of, of the Holy Spirit empowering us. And so just as the promise of victory emboldened the Israelites in Joshua 10, the promises that we see in the Bible should embolden us today. I think what happens, though, is we forget about these promises that were given to us. I think that's why Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, he said, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. In other words, don't, don't forget the truth. Don't forget the mercy. He says, Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. And that truth that we're talking about here is the truth of God's word, which would include his promises. And how do we ensure that we don't forget them? Well, going back to what Solomon says, he says we are to bind it as a necklace around our neck or to write them in our hearts. In other words, we need to memorize our, these promises or study them so that your mind can recall them when you're going through something difficult. Remembering these promises can help you live a bold life for Christ, just as the promise of victory emboldened the Israelite army. But not only did God promise Joshua victory, we also see that he also helps them 
in the actual battle. In other words, he actually fights for them. In fact, there's two specific ways that God fights for the Israelites, and we see them in verses 10 and 11. So the first way that he fights for the Israelites is that he gets into the heads of the Amorite armies. Look in verse 10. It starts out saying this, And the Lord discomfited them. He discomfited the Amorites before Israel. Now that word discomfited there basically means to confuse them or to disturb them. And I was thinking, you know, when we today, when we're confused, uh, we're not in a good situation. It can be pretty scary and uncomfortable to be in a position of being uh, confused. I remember uh, back on March 17th, uh, I felt pretty good for most of the day leading up to uh, our wedding. But in that last hour or so, I was starting to feel um, discomfited. I was getting a little nervous. I was getting a little uncomfortable. Uh, and I remember when uh, Tony Joe's grandpa said it was time to go. He was actually was the one that officiated the wedding for us. And he, he looked at me and he looked at my brother, who was my best man. He said, it's time to go. Let's go upstage. And all of a sudden, my legs decided that they were going to just you know, feel like rubber. And I could barely walk. My, my heart was just beating out of my chest. And I think a big reason why I was uh, starting to kind of panic inside was I, all of a sudden, I didn't feel very prepared for, for the wedding. I was, I was going up there, and I'm going through my mind like, okay, I, I don't really know what's going to happen. Like, I, I was starting to panic, and I was like, I know Lindsay Vance, she's going to come up and sing at some point, but I can't remember when it is. Uh, I know we're going to exchange rings at some point. Uh, oh, and Pastor Will is going to introduce the, the sand ceremony, and, and what's the name of my bride again? I can't remember. I was starting, I was just so confused. I was so uh, just uncomfortable. I was so out of sorts, and some of you probably saw this, that when we were exchanging rings, I stuck out my right hand, and Tony didn't notice at first until she put the ring halfway up the finger, and she goes, Ace, that's the wrong hand. I said, just, just put it on there. I'll get it over with later. We'll, we'll put it on later, okay? Just, just put it on. I was just so out of sorts on that day. But I was thinking, you know, as nervous as I felt that day, I can't imagine how the nerves of the Amorites, how they must have felt that day when they realized that the Israelite army was coming their way. And to make it worse for them, the Lord actually made them uncomfortable. He made them nervous. And so this undoubtedly worked for the Israelites' advantage, and we see that they actually begin to flee. So we see that the first thing God does is he gets in the heads of the Amorites, but then he does a second thing for the Israelites by fighting for them. He actually brings about a hailstorm upon the enemies. We see in verse 11, it shows that the Amorites soon realize that they're not going to win this battle, and so they begin to retreat. And so it says in verse 11, And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Haran, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. Now check this out. This is an incredible fact, at least in my eyes. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So just as many people died from the hailstorm than the Israelites killed. And this would suggest also another thing that uh, when I think of, of, of hailstorms or maybe hail coming down, they're usually little pieces. Uh, or, but, but these must have been huge pieces of hail that actually kill these, these, these Amorites. So uh, to me, this is another part of the story, again, that ought to inspire us and encourage us today. Uh, see, God, uh, he's, still, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, just as God fought for them, he still fights for, our, for us on our behalf today. Whatever you're going through, take comfort in the promises of God and also take comfort in this, knowing that God fights for us. He is working out things on our behalf. We are not alone in this struggle. And I especially want to say this to people that maybe are in a waiting period for something. You, you've been praying for something, for God to reveal something for you, or God to, pro, to provide something for you, and, and it hasn't happened yet. I want you to know it's not because God's forgotten you. It's not because God has just put you to the side. No, he is working things out on your behalf. Don't forget that. So we see that God promises the people of Israel victory. Then we see that he fights for them by, by instilling fear in the Amorites and then also bringing down hailstones on them. But then comes the most famous part of the story. Quite frankly, it's probably my favorite part of the story as well. Verse 12 shows us that Joshua prays to God in the middle of this battle, and his prayer request, quite honestly, is an incredibly bold one. 
He asked for the sun to stand still over Gibeon and for the moon to stand still in the valley of Agilon. But what's even more amazing that, than this request is the fact that God does exactly what Joshua requests of him. Verse 13, And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Now, uh, as you might expect, there's actually been all sorts of explanations, theories, interpretations of actually what happened on that fateful day. Now, the first thing I'll say, though, is that on the surface, it appears that while the Israelite army was doing very well in this battle, thanks to God helping them out, Joshua realized that they soon were facing a predicament. Night was about to come, which obviously would mean it would soon grow dark. He knew that darkness would make it easier for some of the enemy to retreat, to run or to hide, and so Joshua and his army didn't want that to happen. Uh, they wouldn't be satisfied until the enemies were completely destroyed. But again, they can't stop the evening from coming unless they had divine intervention from God. So Joshua asks God for the sun to stay where it was so that they could have the light of day for as long as they needed it to defeat the Amorite armies. Again, we see that God grants that request, but there's some other theories out there that I found interesting, and I wanted to share them with you just to kind of give you a little bit of a good perspective of what people think. Uh, one theory, this is kind of obvious and not my favorite theory, obviously, but some like to say, well, no, this didn't happen literally. It's to be taken symbolically. Uh, not surprisingly, the people that tout this theory tend to be more of the liberal Bible scholars. And they base this theory off of what they see in the middle of verse 13. If you see in the middle of verse 13, it says this, Is not this written in the book of Jasher? Now, the book of Jasher is not found in the Bible. But the book of Jasher appears to be a book, of, a, a collection of poems and songs that would commemorate uh, great moments in the history of Israel. And they were kind of artistic things and maybe retellings of stories. So people will argue, oh, well, they, they mentioned that this event is recorded in a book of poems and songs, so then this it can't be taken literally. And other people say, well, it can't be taken literally because uh, probably what they meant was that it felt like the sun stood still. Just like in today's language, maybe we, we're not having a good day and we go, oh, the day just won't end. Well, the day is ending, it just feels longer. And that they say, well, no, and that's what the Israelites are doing. The Israelites are doing so much fighting, it felt like a longer day than it really was. Now, I... You know, personally, I don't think these are very good theories. All you have to do is look at the rest of this chapter and really even the, all of the book of Joshua to know that this is not a good theory. See, remember, the book of Joshua is with really all of the Bible. It's an actual historical account. And wouldn't it seem strange that in the middle of a historical account, we start seeing poetic language of something that didn't really happen? Now, and like imagine opening your history book and reading about World War II and in the middle of it, there's a poem. That doesn't make any sense. Or imagine this. I go to the grocery store one day because I need to pick up a few things for uh, Tony Joe because she's about to make a, a nice dinner for us. And I, come, I get home from the store, I hand her the bag, and I go, Honey, you wouldn't believe the stuff that happened to me while I was out there getting what you needed at the grocery store. And she goes, Well, what was it? What happened? And I say, Well, first of all, as I went into the parking lot, this guy backed out of his parking spot and almost hit me. I almost had an accident. It was this close. Then I, I found a parking spot. And I walk into the store, and I say hi to uh, an employee, and he just says something so rude to me. And then on top of that, I get to the aisle where the spices are that you need to make your dinner, and all the spices are out. They're all gone. And then I stop, and I have this distant look in my eye. And then I say this, Tony, it was then that I felt my heart melting into a puddle of tears. I felt as if my whole world shattered before my eyes. And for the first time, I saw the world for what it really was, a deep, dark place. If that happened, Tony Joe would have me institutionalized. I mean, that's just crazy. I wouldn't do that. I'm telling a story. I'm telling an account. I'm not going to give a poem or something poetic in the middle of it. So why would it happen here in Joshua? But I think the bigger issue here with, with people trying to explain away this miracle is that they're missing a big part of the Christian faith. Uh, God is working around us all the time, and it is miraculous, church. Uh, C.S. Lewis once said this, The mind that asks for a non-miraculous Christianity is a mind in process of relapsing from Christianity into mere religion. And as Warren Wearsby pointed out, 
It doesn't really make sense to say that God can't perform miracles. I mean, after all, he created everything that we see. So that would be like saying that God is limited by his own creation. And even Wearsby said, I have a difficult time believing in a God like that. So the miracles that we see in the Bible and in our lives, it's what makes our faith, our relationship with God, real. It makes it stand out. So never doubt the miraculous abilities of God. But now most really uh, uh, legit scholars would agree that an actual miracle took place here. They just have different explanations as to how God performed it. Uh, one uh, theory was that, that uh, in verse 13, it also says that the son hasted not to go down, which would mean that he ever, God slowed everything down. You see, if you kept the sun and the moon where they were, it would throw everything in the earth into chaos. And so maybe what God did was slow everything down as, to, as it appeared to stand still. Uh, others say that God allowed a miraculous refraction of the sunlight to shine down on Gibeon so that as the sun was moving uh, through, the, through the sky, that there was still one bit of sunlight hitting Gibeon. So even as the sun was setting, it felt like in the middle of the day for uh, the Israelites. And then, of course, there's others who say, listen, don't make this more complicated than it is. The moon and the sun just stood still. God granted Joshua his request. Now, I will bring up one more uh, theory and interpretation because some very respected scholars, including Dr. J. Vernon McGee, bring this up. Uh, in verse 13, when we talk about the sun standing still, some translations say that the sun was silent. In other words, Dr. McGee says that Joshua wasn't asking for more sunlight. He was asking for less sunshine. We have to remember the climate back in that time in that part of the world. It's a lot hotter than even here. It would have been at least 110 degrees in the shade on that day, and there would have been no shade, so it would have been a lot hotter. And so because of that heat and the fact that the Israelite army was probably tired from marching all night and now fighting all day in the hot sun, McGee is saying that Joshua was asking God to give them shade to, to cool the heat. So as you can see, there's many theories and interpretations as to what happened, and I hope I didn't bore you with that. I was trying to just give you a little bit of an education of what's going on, but, but whatever theory you choose, that, that's up to you. And really, that's not important. What is important is that verse 14 tells us that there was no other day like it, that God changed the laws of the universe, the very laws of nature, because Joshua asked him to. Uh, Dr. McGee said that uh, he once heard a college professor say it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thought to think that God would change the very laws of nature just for the request of one man. Dr. McGee replied, well, yes, sir. Actually, it is a ridiculous thought. But here's the interesting thing. God did do that. And even, I think, even more ridiculous thought is that there would be a God that would love us so much that he would come down in the flesh to die for us. But he did that, too. Maybe today, some of you feel like you are in a moment that Joshua was facing at that time. Your marriage is on the rocks. Your family is falling apart. Your kids aren't coming back to church. You're in danger of losing your job, or you have lost your job. You're looking for another one, or you just flat out can't pay your bills. It feels like the only way out of your situation is a miracle. A miracle like a sun and a moon standing still in the sky. Well, let me encourage you tonight. The same God who granted Joshua's request in the heat of battle is the same God that is looking out for you and I tonight. If he can change the very laws of nature, don't you think he can heal your marriage? Don't you think he can guide your kids back to him? Don't you think he can provide for you financially or to open doors for you or your career when you're looking for a new job? If you're in the middle of a time where it feels like you need the sun to stand still in order to get out of the pit that you're in, do what Joshua did. Cry out to God to provide exactly what you need because he is there listening. I'm going to be wrapping up here in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to say that I think a lot of us find ourselves in the middle of some sort of battle. And I was thinking again of college and high school. Uh, you guys are in a battle, uh, maybe to stay pure. Maybe he's trying to figure out what, what is my future? What, what does the future have in store for me? And it may seem impossible for you to stay pure. Or it may seem impossible for you to know what God has in store for you. But here's the thing. You can cry out to God for help. Remember, the Israelites, they marched forth in battle. They were emboldened by God's promise of victory. And it's, you can take courage in knowing that he has already made promises to you as well. 
Take courage in knowing that he will fight for you and he will listen to your cries for help. But you have to turn to him during this time. I don't think you know what's best for you today. You know what God wants. And then for a lot of other people, again, you have a family that's falling apart, a marriage that's falling apart, a life that's falling apart. God hasn't left you. He is for you. You can cry out to God for help. Uh, we have these moments where we need the sun to stand still and we, we need God to, to move on our behalf. And it's in those moments that we have to decide what to do. Do we turn to the world for help? Do we try to do this on our own or do we turn to God? We know what Joshua did. And really, the Bible is filled with other stories like this. People who were faced with impossible situations. But what made those stories great and what you know, made these people great is that they allowed and what they were able to do mighty things is that they decided to get on their knees, humble the, themselves before God, and ask him to move on their behalf. And you can have that moment too. It starts on your knees, calling out to God. You can have that sun stand still moment if you cry out to him. Uh, on Wednesday night, some of you may remember, uh, we went over Luke 18 which tells the parable of uh, the widow asking the unjust judge who did not fear God or man, uh, she asked uh, this judge for justice. And eventually, even though this judge didn't, you know, wasn't a good man or a good judge, we read that he actually does give this widow justice because of the persistence of the widow. And Jesus says this in Luke 18, 7. He said, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Jesus is saying that if this unjust judge listens to a widow that he cares nothing about, how much more does our heavenly Father listen to his children? And he will provide for you what you need. But here's one thing I want you to remember. It may not happen on the timeline that you want it to happen on. Uh, we live in a world where we, uh, uh, especially in America, we can have things pretty immediate. I, I was thinking as I was studying you know, over that um, uh, for, I actually have Amazon Prime now. Some of you may know Amazon Prime. It's, it's that online service. And the perk there, or one of the perks that you pay a little bit extra for, is that you, everything that you order, no matter what you order off of Amazon Prime, you get it in two days. And guess what? It's very successful. Why? Well, because people don't have time to sit around four or five days for the thing they order. They want it now. They want it in two days' time. And I was thinking, you know, that attitude spills over into our prayers. Uh, we bring our needs to God, and we expect Him to answer it in two days. We want an Amazon Prime God. Well, that's not how He operates. And you see, uh, Joshua, some of you may say, well, look at Joshua. He asked God to, for the sun to stand still, and He answered it right away. Well, yes, it was because He needed it right away. See, if you're waiting for God to do something and it hasn't happened yet, it's because you don't need it quite yet. That may be frustrating to hear, but listen, he's not leaving you out to dry. He's there with you in your battle. And when that moment comes, when the sun truly needs to stand still in your life, he will come in right on time and do exactly what you need him to do. Just trust him. Get on your knees. Humble yourself and cry out to him. And when that happens... And God provides for you, you will have that day that was like no other day. Because God pulled through for you. As we bow our head and close our eyes, as some of you may be in that situation tonight, whatever situation, I don't know what it is. Again, you, you, your marriage is falling apart. Your family life is falling apart. Whatever it is. And you need the sun to stand still in your life. And I can say tonight, you need to go to God just as Joshua did. Cry out to him. Get on your knees and pray to God. In fact, you can come forward tonight and you can do that. Uh, but for some of you, the, the reason why I mentioned uh, at the end about how it may not work on your timeline is that you may not trust God. You may think, well, I, I need this done. I need this done now. I, I don't know if I can trust God to take care of the situation. Well, you need to ask God to change you because he, you, you can't trust him. He will come through for you. You can come forward tonight and ask God to change you. And, of course, I never want to leave with that offering, uh, that chance of salvation for that person that's here tonight. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Tonight's the night to do it. All you have to do is come forward. Ask Jesus to save you. Put your full trust in him, and you will be a Christian, and you are on your way to heaven. Uh, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. 
Thank you so much for just another opportunity to be able to share with uh, everybody here what you've laid on my heart, God. Thank you that you are still there for us, that you listen to us. You've made us promises, God, and you are fighting for us. And God, that we can cry out to you for that sun stands still moment in our lives. God, if there's anybody here tonight that needs uh, to come forward and make a decision for you, I ask that they do that, God, and that we change lives tonight. We love you, God. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And please stand as uh, Kevin Pope leads us in invitation. Page 81. Just as I am without one plea, but that tonight from Brother Ace, and I don't know about you, but I think his hair looked immaculate this evening. Why hasn't anybody ever said that about my hair? It's because I'm losing it, that's why. I have a two announcements. Uh, this Saturday night is the Father-Son Banquet. You do not have to have your son here or your father here to come to that. Uh, please come and join us this Saturday evening, 5 o'clock. Lamar Cherry will be our guest speaker. And it uh, starts at 5 o'clock. There'll be food and uh, festivities, so please come for that. Uh, we are down, I believe, to, we need two sponsors uh, for camp. Had one taken care of today, so if you'd like to help us with that, see uh, Brother